Hello students. Um, we have now reached the point in the course where we're going to begin talking about the object-oriented concepts. Um, this is module 7 of the course where we start talking about cl uh, classes and objects. So as you can see here, I'm in uh, the chapter 12 slides, um, but don't get discouraged. I'm only going to spend a few minutes in the slides. I just want to highlight a few important points um, to set the set the base for encapsulation which is going to be our first object oriented concept so I'm going to go ahead and full screen this <clears throat> and this this slide uh, represents the architecture of a three layered application as you can see at the top so what does that mean so an application typically has some sort of user interface as you can see by this first gray box at the top our user interface at the moment is typically uh, main Windows Forms classes, so we always have some sort of form that in, that inherits from the base form class, and then from there we start building our form with text boxes, labels, um, buttons, <clears throat> etc., etc. So the presentation layer can be variable. If you've worked in any other type of organization or if you've been on the, on the internet you can tell that the presentation layer can be in Chrome so it can be maybe some HTML, it can be a web page, you might be searching Amazon, eBay, whatever you might be doing. Uh, there's all kinds of different technologies that you can use for a presentation layer. So there's, um, if anybody has used JavaScript technologies, there's Angular and React. Uh, Microsoft uses Windows Forms. They also use a and a, a language called XAML or XAML. So these are all of the ways you can display things to a user. <clears throat> Next there's a middle layer or business classes. So this is typically some sort of service that your presentation layer goes and reaches out to uh, to go and retrieve stuff from a database which is, as you can see here a third layer or a database layer. So usually in a three-tiered application which you'll find in most enterprises you'll have a website or something that goes and reaches out so like Facebook that reaches out to a middle layer or a service layer that goes and fetches data and returns it to the presentation layer to be displayed so this is strategic in a way that if if your if your presentation layer changes you don't have to rewrite all of this stuff you just have to rewrite your presentation layer or maybe if your database architecture changes, all you have to do is just manipulate your database and maybe a little bit of your service, but you don't have to change anything about your presentation layer. So having a separation of concerns here allows you to streamline your application uh, coding and streamline your processes. <clears throat> and it also allows you to maybe call and get things from a database for multiple applications without having to rewrite this middle layer. So for example, if you had a presentation layer that was a a web page or something that could get um, product information from a database, you could also have maybe an Android or an iOS application do the same thing, and all you have to do is just rewrite the presentation layer. Layer You already have the service layer, or the middle layer, and the database layer. <clears throat> and typically, your middle layer or your business logic is also another name for this middle layer. It does some um, business type of logic and really all your presentation layer is just displays it. So whenever we work with encapsulation what we're going to try to do is encapsulate these things that come out of the database that way we can display them on our web pages or our, our Windows forms in our case. So for example if we have a members of a product class so it could be a product that we're trying to buy on Amazon like a shirt or a guitar or a broom, whatever the case may be, a book. <clears throat> Excuse me. This class can have properties like a code, a description, and a price. And it can also have methods in it, like to be able to just get the display text that so we want to display it on our website, whatever the case may be. And we'll work with this more later when I start digging into the code of the application. It can also have constructors. So what code do I call whenever I build this object? And then once I start digging into the code, you can see why um, constructors are used a lot, but typically 
it's easier to just use um, the object initializer, but it, it does, just depends on your use case. So here are some types of class members. We've already talked about properties. Um, that's just things on your class, like your text box has a name property, um, your form has a name property, your button has a text property. You have methods, so we've seen prior, like get display text, we've seen that a form has a close method, that, so the ability to close. <clears throat> uh, class members can have constructors, so what code do you want to be called whenever you make a new one of these things? So do you want to do you want all of your properties to have a certain um, a certain default value, like a string might have an empty value or a boolean might have a false value, something like that. And then some of the, uh, the less used um, class members are delegates. We've seen delegates when we start talking about event handlers and how we set up restrictions for those. As you can see, a special type of object that is used to pass a method as an argument. We've seen that when we use event handlers. Uh, so what well, goes hand in hand with event handlers, we have events, some of signa, a uh, signal that notifies other objects that something noteworthy has occurred, such as a button click event, a text box, text changed event, a uh, radio button check changed event, etc., etc. A field, which is a variable that's declared at the class level, which is a little different than a property, but a lot of times these names are interchanged as property and field. And then a constant, which is just what it says there, a constant. So uh, a field that never changes, or a property that never changes. And then here are some class members that are a lot less common. You can have an indexer, which is a special type of property that allows uh, individual items within your class to be accessed uh, by a particular index value. So it's kind of like an array, how you can use the index of an array. But this, you can have different types. Um, there's a PowerPoint slide that covers more on indexers and coming uh, modules. There's operators, so you can overload the plus or minus operator, like if you're building uh, unique lists. And then a class, so you can have a class within a class so you can have a class um, that might be like a node or something small that only your class uses. Here are some objects, uh, some concepts for objects we're going to adhere to. So we've already talked about an object as a self-contained unit that has properties, methods, and members. So we've already seen text boxes and buttons, and every text box can have different properties since, you, since they're all instances of a class, which is your next bullet point, an object is an instance of a class, so you can have multiple instances of a text box or multiple instances of a button, and as we'll come to see in, in coming modules, you can have multiple instances of a form. So you can have uh, your main form, and then from that can spawn subforms. You, you can try to get more information from the user. So the third bullet point right here is encapsulation. So this is what uh, this whole module is about. So the first object-oriented concept is encapsulation. That's one of the fundamental concepts of object-oriented programming. And it lets you control the data operations within a class that are exposed to other classes. So what does that mean? That means you can tell a property whether it needs to be public or private. You can tell a method whether it needs to be public or private. And it's really just being able to show the user exactly what you want them to see or the user of your class and then hide from them what they don't need to know about. So if you have a private method or something like that. It's also called data hiding that you'll come to find in this fourth bullet. And then notice this fifth bullet which is somewhat important although a class can have many different types of members that we've seen with events, a uh, class within a class, so a subclass, most of the classes you'll create have just properties, methods, and constructors. So 90% uh, of your classes should just have those three things in it. If you're maybe building a custom class or a custom list, maybe you'll have some other things like uh, the operator overload and stuff like that. But most of the time, your classes will just pretty much be plain old C-sharp classes or POCOs that don't have a lot in them. So here's an example of a class. Maybe we want to try to get a product. As you can see here, we have private fields or class level uh, fields at the top, code, description, and price. 
here's public product. And again, I'll start digging into this more in Visual Studio, so I'm just going to skim over it here. So we have a constructor here, which is just the default constructor. This might look pretty similar whenever we make new instances of a text box or something like that, where we just want to new it up real fast. Here's a constructor. As you can see, it has the same name as your class here. So they have the same name. And then we're going to pass in things to our object and then set uh, the variables here for the fields. Here's the simple ability to get or set the code on a certain instance of a product. And then I'll show you a, a simpler way to do it later on. Again, a description, a price. <clears throat> and then here's a method of our product to be able to get the display text. So maybe you want to display this on a website and you can display it as the code plus a separator which might be a comma or something. You, you can pass it into this method plus the price plus a description. So for example, whenever we want to make a new product, we have two products here, product one and product two. And then from there, product one equals a new product, and here's where we're going to use that second constructor we had, and we're going to give it the code of the product, the description of the product, and the price of the product. The same with this line of code. And then here's some code below uh, that creates this same stuff up here, but with object initializers using the default constructor. So we have product one equals new product, and you can't see, but um, it's optional in C-sharp to put the, bra the parentheses here if you're making, if you're using the object initializer. So the, the IDE will just kind of understand what you're trying to do if you don't put the parentheses here. But then once you put the brackets, you can start saying what you want each property to be, or, or you can put make uh, the code, the description, and the price. So it's just a, a little bit of a shorthand instead of passing it to the constructor and having the constructor do the rest of the work. So whenever we make a new class, we go to an Add New Item window. We click on the Class option, and then you type in the name of your class. In this case, it's product.cs. And then the starting code for a new class, which I'll go over here in a second. OK, I'm just trying to make sure I'm not missing anything before we start coding this thing. Okay, so in the next video I'm going to start in Visual Studio and start um, from scratch on this product class and show you exactly how to go about this. Thanks.